Today we are lucky to be one on one with Tom Schnabel. <laughs> So, Tom, I have so many questions for you, but I want to start at the beginning. Can you tell me your earliest memory of music? It was probably down below in my parents. There was like a, they used to call it a rumpus room, which sounds really weird, <laughs> but they call it, it was like a room kind of underneath the house. And there was a huge Magnavox console that my father had bought as at a PX, a Navy store, um, during World War II. And it was probably a 78 RPM record. And it m might have been Little Richard and Tutti Frutti on a specialty um, 78 RPM record, 10 inch. Do you remember how music made you feel, or specifically that moment? It was just so strong and it just made you want to just dance and go crazy around around the room and my sister and my older brother and we would all this is when my parents were out by the way so we could turn up the volume <laughs> and i think it was just the, the the physical feeling of wanting to 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 move with this powerful powerful sound i think that where you come from really influences who you are right so you were born in la you right went to school in la right um what is it about los angeles specifically that shaped you and considering it's kind of a city that people feel is culturally dry, what can you tell us about Los Angeles that other people don't know? So I love LA. You can drive in your car and you can go to the snow, you can go to the ocean, you can go to the desert, all these different things. And a lot of people have felt the same way. Famous French philosophers, Michel Foucault, taught at Irvine and took LSD in like Death Valley or the, or the you know, one of the Joshua tree and had a religious experience. So you have, you know, a lot of people who came here and were, were affected. Think of all the people, the James Dean and all the actors who came here. You know, I think that, I think that in New York on the, on the East Coast, you're looking at old European culture and the older culture. But California has always looked, you know, partially to the East, to, to Japan, to China. There's the whole ocean element. And so, um, you know, this is why people say that we need to be a separate country in <laughs> California. So you've seen music evolve, to say the least, and how we access and circulate music has changed. Um, what do you think is better now? What do you think we're missing out on, if anything? Or what has your, your experience been watching that change? I think we have more music available now than ever before. Um, a lot has changed with the, you know, the online pur purchasing and you know, computer and stuff like that. So I think there's more available now than ever before. However, I will also say that I think that, that the type of music that people listen to and just get exposed to, whether it's, I don't know, TV or ads or radio, has shrunk and that it's not nearly as much um, as it once was. You know, one thing when I grew up, like, um, we used to listen to um, KGFJ. It was a rhythm and blues station. And so, and at that time, you know, in the 50s, you know, you'd have what they call race stations where there's black music on one station and then white music on the other. So you'd hear Little Richard on KGFJ and Pat Boone on the, doing a, a horrible, awful version of Tutti Frutti, you know, uh, on, the, on the white stations. But I, I, I grew up with those stations and then, there were also, there were other R&B stations. Um, there, were, uh, there were some Latin stations too. Um, ra radio has become more um, sort of conglomerate, you know, and I think that it's, it, it, it's, it's sort of shrunk. However, there is the web. You can go anywhere. So it's kind of weird. I think that the cho there are more choices than ever, but I think people aren't availing them uh, themselves. I sort of like a little more mystical and unknown and you know I go for stuff that's that's not all that well known that's mm -hmm. that's what I that's what I like doing I really want to know what you think about the relationship between music media and what's happening in life meaning do you think that media shapes what happens in real life does real life shape what happens in media or how have you seen that relationship change um, I think a lot of media is propagandistic and I think that they, they try to shape how people think, you know. Um, you know, you'll see these fads, you know, where all of a sudden, you know, there's some new 
new kid that you know everybody's listening to. Now I like certain things like Gangnam Dance. I like that <laughs> a lot. But um, in terms of the new star, the, you know, some young kid that has beautiful hair, you know, Justin Bieber or whatever. Um, but I think it's also it's propagandistic, and I think there's, and it sells product. And I think um, in listening to your interview with Garth Trinidad, he mentions the same thing. It's about product placement. It's about the commodification of music. And I don't like to use a lot of fancy words, but um, when radio stations were smaller and they didn't have so much money on the line and they weren't trying to have big advertiser uh, spend a lot of money to get their ads on, I thought the music was better. I thought the DJs had more choices. But radio became a lot more corporate. Big corporate like Clear Channel bought radio stations and they want to make a lot of money. So, you know, they're sell, sell a big ad, make a lot of money, but they got to play, they can't play anything that's too far out. And I also think like in even listening to the jazz station now, um, and, and to some extent the classical music stations, they want to have people playing them at work and in the, the, do, the offices and stuff like that so they tame it down so they don't blow anybody out of the water. So in that sense, yeah, they're trying to be safer for advertisers, but they're not playing anything uh, sort of out of the sort of middle road. Mm -hmm. so, I, so, I think that, um, so I think that people aren't exposed to half of what they, they could be, but it depends on how far you want to go. Me, I'm like a, I don't know, like a musical gopher. I'm just going to go in and just dig around and just find whatever I can. And I've, I've kind of always been like that. I'm kind of, I'm, I'm very curious. You obviously changed KCRW into something kind of unheard of, right? A small station becomes this source for culture all over the world. Do you still believe in public radio now? And, and what was it that you did that made KCRW what it is? Well, I wanted diversity. Mm -hmm. when, I, when I became music director in, seven, in the summer of 79, it was a tiny station. You could do almost anything. The shows weren't very good. You know, we had to broadcast. They had to broadcast the baseball game and the football game. They had to have the faculty on the air, faculty that had absolutely nothing to say. And that all changed due to Ruth Seymour, who was a general manager. She had a, a vision of the little station that could be, that could be big. Um, you know, my aim, there wasn't much. There was classical music during the daytime, a little bit, and some jazz at night. That's all there was. So I went in there and I said, well, you know, we, we need to hear a lot of other things. Reggae was huge then. Um, Bob Marley was still alive in 79, and the first show that I put on in the fall was uh, the Reggae Beat, which became, next to Morning Becomes Eclectic, the most popular program. Maybe even more popular because they were on the weekend and everybody could listen. Bob Marley was the first interview on, on, the, on the Reggae Beat. But I wanted, to, I wanted to expand the sound of the station, and I also had a strong feeling that L.A. is made up of a lot of different people. People come here from all over the world, so why are we just going to broadcast even just jazz or rock and roll or anything like that? So, so the next show went on was, a, was an African show. So I wanted to broaden, and that, but that was my vision. That was my vision of what I wanted to do, is to make, if there are hundreds of languages spoken in L.A., why would you only be playing, you know, one or two kinds of music? That just seemed wrong to me. So I wanted to expand it, and I did. You've been all over the world. You know music from all over the world. And I want to ask you, is there a specific place you think right now um, is the future of music or they're doing something really exciting in particular? You know, it's, it's with the globalization, you know, and, and uh, computers and computer programming, stuff then to start with the 808 drum machine, stuff like that. You know, in some ways, music has become, I wouldn't say more homogenized, but production techniques and stuff. It's not like people are going into a, a big studio, uh, you know, or even a small radio studio anymore. They're making music on their computers. I would say probably, I would say Africa really is the, is the country to, 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 because you've got this strong backbone of music, of, of, of rhythm, of ritual and sacrament and all these things. But then you've also got the, the newer generation that are using computers and using all sorts of things. I mean, you have a band like Konono Number no. 1 and there's some other bands too where they go in and they take stuff out of garbage cans and, and, and make this incredible music, I mean, it's sort of in-your-face music, but incredible, clangy, everything else, you know. 
Do you have a particular travel memory or experience with music that has stuck with you the most? Something spiritual, something unusual that you think about or that moved you? You know, I remember the first day I was in Brazil, um, my friend in Brazil, uh, Roberto Lestinji, took me to Maracanã, which is the, the, the 200,000 seat soccer stadium. Mm -hmm. And I'd never seen anything so big. And there were two local teams playing, but there was intense rivalry and there were armed guards all up and down the rows to keep people from fighting. And every section had their little samba like, you know, there would be a, a quick up, uh, there would be an agogo, which is a little thing. There would be a little uh, pandero, the little uh, frame drum. Um, and everybody had their little samba thing go going, going on. I also remember going to a candomblé ceremony up in the hills um, uh, in, in Bahia, you know, up. And it was a little scary, but this beautiful ceremony, you know, with, you know, with this music and the priest and the priestess all dressed in white. It was so or orderly and organized and, and beautiful and it was sacramental. And that was and that was that was be, that was beautiful, beautiful. And I mean, uh, lots of memories. I mean, I guess I could go on. I remember I went to there was a, a little dance studio in um, off La Cienega, and one of my first dance teachers was was there. And uh, there was Day of the Drum, and they had uh, a bunch of bata drummers, the two-headed drums. There's one on the wall over there. Um, and con uh, some conga drums, and they just played this like uh, Yoruba, uh, Santa, San Santeria, you know, sacred music. And I remember shutting my eyes, and, and it's like, okay, there's nothing else happening. It's just all I was feeling was the music and the feeling. And I wasn't think. and music will do that if you're really affected by it. You're not thinking about what you have to do tomorrow. You're not thinking about an appointment that you have to make or something that you don't want to do or something that's unpleasant or a memory or whatever you're just you're just there completely if you had to choose one song to play every time you entered a room so basically your entrance song what song would you choose i think it would have to be a coltrane song um i think i would play my favorite things if, if that doesn't sound too pretentious you know, I think that was it. That was a song that I played in my bedroom in my parents' home all the time. I think it would be that. And because Coltrane to me changed my life. It was really Coltrane when I was 16, I heard a Coltrane uh, album that basically said, music is so much more powerful than just entertainment or fun or dance or anything. It's something that goes deep into your soul, into your, into your spirit. It really goes some, someplace really powerful and deep. And that made me a music lover for my whole life. So it would have to be something by Coltrane. I think my favorite things would be a good choice. Mm -hmm.